Amen. Thank you so much, Marlene Habiger, for playing for us the month of December. This is her last day for a while, so thank you, thank you for the beautiful Christmas songs that you've played for us this month. Good afternoon to each of you who are here in the chapel, and for those of you who are watching later on YouTube or Facebook, welcome. It's good to have all of you here worshiping with us today. We have um, kind of an exciting day, at least it's, a, it's an exciting day for me. We have chaplain, uh, actually, well, chaplain pastor <laughs> uh, Nadine Friesen here to share a word with us. And some of you who have been at Showalter Villa for a while may remember Nadine Friesen. She um, was the person who was in my job now before I came here and was here for several years and um, I have to say I was nervous to, to step into her shoes when she left um, but it's been such an honor to to learn from Nadine and all the things that she left behind for me to learn. And I'm glad that she agreed to come share with us today. She is an independent living resident now here on this campus and she lives at Lakeside Village. And she has been in a clergy woman for about 47 years, served as a pastor at Hillsboro Mennonite Brethren Church and also chaplain at, at a hospice and also here on this campus. So welcome, Nadine. Oh, one thing she loves to do is read on her iPad, and um, she also has enjoyed doing puzzles. I know there are quite a few of you here that enjoy doing puzzles, and being with family and friends. So that's a little bit about Nadine. I hope you had a wonderful Christmas wherever you celebrated, whether you were here, if you were celebrating with family. I hope you had a good season of remembering Christ. You might notice that we have lots of uh, Christmas carols that we're going to be singing today. I felt like we need to have a chance to sing more of them, so we will be singing those today. And also you might notice that all of our candles are lit, including the Christ candle and Jesus, baby Jesus is here in front of the creche. So Christmas is here, Christ is born. Amen. I invite you to look at the front of your order of worship for the call to worship. This is based on Isaiah 60, one through three. I will read the light print by myself, and then if you could join me, and we'll read together the dark print. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you, Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Let's turn in our hymn books, the ones with the stripe across the top, to 212, O Come All Ye Faithful, 212. Thank you. 
watching from home, I invite you to get your Bibles and turn to Matthew 2. If you are here in the worship space, on the back is a very long scripture passage, Matthew 2. And you might want to follow along as I read. This is the passage that Chaplain Nadine has chosen as we as she shares about the wise men. Where should we put the wise men is the name of her, her sermon. So let's read about their journey, and then we'll sing a hymn, and then we'll hear from Nadine. Matthew 2. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him, and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, and land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to be shepherd, to shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Now, after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. <coughs> when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated and sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, according to the time he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Rama, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they were no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up. Take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in a place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. Let's turn in our hymnals now to the first Noel. 
That's on page 179, the first Noel, 179. Oh, excuse me. Thank you, 199. I have that printed incorrectly. Sure enough. Let's sing verses 3, 4, and 5. So it's, that's also a little different on your program. I think I was using a different hymnal when I first started this. 199. First, let's start with verse 3. That, that's where the wise men begin. She does, enjoying getting to know her. But I left to take an extra day or two of vacation around Christmas time. And on Christmas Eve, I had this great big old brain bleed that came out of nowhere. I was life watched to Wichita, to ICU, and for the next 49 days, I have absolutely no memory of what happened there except that I know many of you here at Showalter prayed very faithfully for me. I know Wendy gave you updates from the Caring Bridge, and I just want to say a big thank you to you. There were times when the doctors weren't sure that I would be able to talk again, that I would be able to walk, or that I would be able to live independently, and I'm doing all three, and give thanks to God every day for that and again to you for your prayer support 
in um, helping me through that time, which again, like I say, I don't remember. You may even have some people came to visit me and I don't even remember that. So um, I think that was a gift from God. People have asked me if I was scared, if I was gonna die or what they were gonna do to me next. And I said, no, I have no memory. So I didn't have anything to worry about. But I wouldn't recommend that, it's rather disorienting. I never had trouble with it as a little girl when I set up the nativity set. And I wanted to bring my old cardboard nativity long set with me, but I've moved a couple times too much in the last couple years, I couldn't find it. But it had those slots, and so you knew just where to stick the cardboard figures. And there was a place that said, wise men. I didn't give it any question, that's just where I put it. Put them, and then I went to Sunday school and I learned a bit more. And then I went to Tabor College and got a Bible major and learned more in-depth Bible study. And then I went on to seminary and kept studying. And lo and behold, I found out there were some things I had always thought about wise men in the story that weren't necessarily supported by scripture. They had come about through tradition, and I think there are some very good understandable reasons as to why that happened. And I don't think it's terribly serious that we know exactly where to put the wise men. In fact, I was thinking as I was sitting here, I should have gone up here to look before I started talking because I assume there are wise men there. There are, and I think they should be because they're an important part of the story. Only Matthew is the only gospel writer who writes anything about the visit of the Magi. And they were called the Magi because that comes from the root word for magician. And they were probably not kings, as we often hear in the, the carol, We Three Kings of Orient are. They were more likely advisors to the kings, which is why Herod wanted to know from them. Their role in life was to study astrology, what happened in the skies and the stars and the sun and the moon and all of that, and then try to interpret what that meant for the times in which they were living. So when people had questions, like Herod did about, so what is all of this about this king that's coming and this star, he called in these wise men or these magi to help him to understand. And they went then to Jerusalem to do that. And the star led them there, but they probably also went to Jerusalem because that's where Herod lived and he was king. So they probably thought if there's gonna be a new king, where else is he gonna live? But that would be in Jerusalem as well. And of course they got rather excited or interesting, unexpected results from that trip. So we know it's only recorded in Matthew. We don't know for sure that there were three wise men, and I hope that isn't too unsettling for you, but there is nothing in scripture, and you heard that as Jill read the only passage we have that gives us information, and I still have a lot of questions I'd like to have answered, but I guess I'll have to take them with me to heaven in my notebook, which is very, very full already of questions. Um, we have assumed that there were three because there were three gifts. And I guess that's where that came from. You've probably heard um, the saying that if the wise men had been wise women, they would have come with a casserole and some pampers if they thought they were going to see a baby. But these wise men brought very different kinds of gifts. And some scholars say they may well have been a group of as many as 30 or so who traveled around together, who studied and worked together at trying to analyze what was going on according to what they saw in the skies and in the heavens. The reason we're not sure that they went to Bethlehem is because, of course, it doesn't say exactly that that's where they went. It does say that they went to the home where Jesus and Mary were and we know that King Herod made this decree. He went all the way from being troubled at the beginning of that passage to being infuriated 
at the end of the passage when he finds out he's been tricked by the wise men. Um, but he said he wanted everyone to and under to be murdered. So it may be that he realized that, I don't know how he would have come to this conclusion, but that Jesus may have been as thought by many as old as a toddler. And so he had already left uh, the place where he was born and where the shepherds and the others first met him. It's also interesting to think that the wise men may have been the first Gentiles to see the Messiah. People had worked, waited for hundreds and hundreds of years for the Messiah to come. And now the Messiah comes and these magi, these wise men who see him in the first couple years of his life at least, were Gentiles. There are again many ideas by scholars as to where they came from. Some say they came from Europe, from Asia, from Persia, from India, from Africa. Again, we don't know for sure. The only thing we can probably surmise from that is that it was a long way away. And some suggest that it was about 800 miles. Well, I don't know if you've ever thought about this. I hadn't really until I started digging into this a bit more. How did those wise men get there? Wherever they went to see Jesus, how did they get there? Um, if they traveled that many hundreds of miles on camels, I don't know who to feel more sorry for, the camels or the wise men, but it certainly says something about their persistence and their intensity in trying to find out what had happened and what this meant for them and for the world around them. The meaning of the gifts, again, there's various interpretations of that. If nothing else, it suggests that they were very extravagant gifts. They weren't casseroles, they weren't pampers, they weren't baby rattles. They were gifts that were valid and appropriate for a king. And so they came to give honor to this king that they had heard was be, had been born and that they wanted to worship. Where we place the wise men in the nativity is definitely not the most significant thing about them and what I'm sharing today. So don't take the wise men away and put them in a separate room. They can stay right there. But I think there are some lessons that we can learn from them, even from the little bit that we do know. And I find, as I read through this passage over and over, it to be very interesting the various responses that these characters had to this event that was going on. We've already kind of mentioned the one of Herod. He goes from being troubled and it says the whole area around him, I guess they were nervous. I don't think they thought Herod was a very good king and they maybe wondered, well, what's next? How's that gonna be? And then he went, goes all the way to being infuriated and as we said, calls out for this decree. Can you imagine the fear of people in Bethlehem, which was not a very large town. I mean, everybody would know what was going on with other people's kids that were two and under. And I can't imagine how that must have felt for them, the fear they must have felt in dealing with that situation. Why did Herod respond as he did? Probably because he was feeling rather threatened. And another part for me of looking at their responses is thinking, are there any ways in which our responses may be the same? They're not gonna be identical, of course, none of us are kings, but there are times I think sometimes when we say, if I'm gonna just surrender everything to the Lord, it's almost a little threatening because what it means, I mean, Herod was concerned because he wasn't gonna have control if there was a new king. And sometimes when we give up control, even to the Lord who we say we love and we trust and we believe is sovereign and all of that, we're not always sure what's going to happen and we can't control it. And I have experienced that intensely in the last year. My best friend of 45 years who lived next door to me in a duplex or a fourplex for over 30 years, we moved to Showalter together 
to enjoy retirement and live life and travel and do all the things people supposedly do when they retire. And we were here for five months and she was suddenly diagnosed out of the blue with acute leukemia and within two and a half months had died and left me here at Showalter and she's enjoying heaven. So giving control over to God doesn't always mean that things are gonna be all easy or wonderful and you all know that. You've experienced that in a variety of ways. Of course, there are the Magi in this event and they have their own characteristics that are rather interesting. I think probably the one that stands out the most for me is their persistence. They are just determined to find out where this king is, who this baby is, and they want to go and they want to worship. That's another question I would take along to heaven is why did they think they would want to worship this baby, this king? Was there something that they had been told or that they understood that made them know that he would be worthy of their worship. But they were very determined um, and they were very alert. Obviously they had heard about the star and they knew that that meant that there was something significant and it was worth following. And so they were alert to seeing how God was at work. One of the things that I try to encourage myself to do, and I don't always do it, but is at the end of each day, try to identify something that is a God sighting that I've had that day. And we can all define God sightings however we want. For me, sometimes it's as simple as making a list of for what am I thankful from this day. Often it has to do with a person that I've met, a conversation I've had, an encouraging word. Um, tonight it will be seeing many of you again. That's been a God sighting that God has brought me through whatever has gone on since I left here and that we are still here together and we are friends. But the Magi were people who were alert. They were looking, as I said, to see what God was up to and they wanted to follow that. Um, we, of course, also have the, um, let's see, you no, know, we've had the, the Magi, we've had Herod. Um, the other part of this story that I think is significant to us, it's not a person, it's not one of the unique characters, but it's the star. Following the star is what gave them the direction that they needed to get to where they wanted to be, to be able to worship and to recognize Jesus. Some scholars have suggested that the reason that this particular star was so bright is because it was so close to the sun, S-U-N, which reminds me very strongly that if we are close to the sun, S-O-N, that brightens our lights as well. And we can shine in the lives of other people, in ourselves. I thought again as we went through our call to worship, and it talks about the darkness that's around, and all we have to do is watch the news for 10 minutes. That's plenty to let us know. There's a lot of darkness in the world in which we live. But you'll note in that one verse is that very important word, but there is still the light of Christ that shines even in the midst of that darkness, and the darkness cannot put that light out. So I just encourage myself, I encourage all of us to think today, how can we reflect that star? How can we be part of what guides other people either to know Christ, to meet Christ, or to just be reminded of all that God has to give for each one of us when we allow him to come, be our guide as we travel through life and follow the star he provides for us. Thank you again for this opportunity to share with you, and God bless in the days to come. Amen. Thank you, Nadine, for your thought-provoking um, and inspiring and encouraging words.
I learned a lot. I'm sure you did too. I had to go back and look at Matthew 2. It does not say the three wise men, does it? It just says the wise men. So yeah, there's some, some interesting things there. Thank you. Now, I chose this hymn in response to her sermon. It's on page 402. Christian, let your burning light. I'm curious if, if any of you have sung this very often. It's fairly new to me, but it's on the theme of being close to the sun, S-O-N, so that our Christ light will fill us and so that we can share Christ light with others. So page 402, Christian, let your burning light. <laughs> singing it with me. Well, before we join into prayer, in prayer together, um, I want to let you know that a neighbor passed away on Monday here on the East neighborhood. Um, her name was Ava May Andres, and she was 91 years old, and her family will, and friends will be gathering this Saturday morning at 11 o'clock at Heston, or excuse me, First Midnight Church in Newton. So we can be praying for their family in this time. Let's join in prayer. God, we thank you for sharing with us, Jesus, the light of the world. Darkness will not overcome the light. And for that, we give you praise and thanks. We thank you that Jesus' light shines within us and fills us with healing love to share with others. And so we offer this time now, God, the people that we carry in our hearts, the people for whom we long for the light of your love and your healing to be in their lives. 
We pray for those who are hurting, who are struggling financially, for those who are ill, for those who are in chronic pain, for those who are struggling with the effects of violence and war. We pray for those who are dying and those who are grieving, grieving the loss of good health, of independence, the loss of loved ones. God, you know these experiences can seem so dark. And we invite your eternal light to fill each person, including ourselves. Fill us with abundant life and light that you offer. Give us encouragement and hope. We especially pray for the family of Ava May Unruh, uh, Anders, excuse me. We pray that you would give their, their family comfort and strength. As they gather this weekend, bring joy to their hearts as they recall good memories. Give them hope in your son, Jesus. Thank you that we are called to be your light in this world. Help us receive your light more fully. Help us stay near your son, Jesus, so that we may reflect his glory to all that we meet each day. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let me get my program. Yes, 318. <laughs> Joy to the world. Let's sing together number 318. Joy to the world. Thank you. 